Hello, welcome to another big data case study. My name is Gopal Krishna Palim. I'm a technology management and strategy consultant specialized in big data and predictive analytics. In today's discussion, we'll be covering M2M telematics, how it helps predictive analytics and condition-based maintenance. Condition-based maintenance, also known as predictive maintenance, essentially boils down to one single point, detecting failures in the early stages and preventing them as early as possible. Every mechanical equipment upon certain period of usage enters a potential failure stage where it starts exhibiting certain anomalies such as change in vibration acoustics or increased temperature gradients, etc., which if ignored leads to a functional failure. The repair cost exponentially increases as we reach the actual point of failure, which means the earlier we detect the failures and try to repair them, the lower the costs will be. Also, the failure or breakdown of equipment poses additional indirect costs such as loss of production and its impact on the customer loyalty because of missed deliveries, additional workforce required for the repair and the spare parts required for the maintenance. With the help of M2M telematics and predictive analytics, the condition-based maintenance detects failures in the early stages and prevents them thereby saving the direct costs and indirect costs associated with these breakdowns. When customers ask us to implement a predictive maintenance strategy for their organization, they are essentially looking for a holistic solution that can take care of multiple individual problems such as how to find the remaining useful life of an asset, how to schedule predictive maintenance, how to predict and maintain right levels of inventory for spare parts, how to optimize the workforce schedules and evaluate what if alternate scenarios. In this video, we are going to briefly cover many of these points assessing how MTM telematics and predictive analytics can help answer these. In a nutshell, the condition-based maintenance system looks as shown here. You can divide the system into three parts. The data collection part, the actual data processing part, and the alerts part. In the data collection part, data is collected from the sensors attached to assets through wireless signals along with the requirement specifications and domain knowledge. Requirement specifications indicate the nature and kind of alerts to be raised, such as increase in temperature or change in vibration acoustics. The design specifications indicate what should be the normal operating parameters so that any anomaly in them can be detected as a failure and raised as an alert. In the analysis phase, the data is collected by M2M framework from the sensors and monitored for real-time anomalies. Also, in parallel, the incoming data is checked with historical data to identify any recurring patterns of failures. The real-time monitoring computation logic accepts streams of input data and identifies any control limit violations in them. In case of any violations, it raises a real-time alert to the control center, such as brake not operating or pressure being increased abnormally or suspension of valve logic, etc. Whereas the expert system looks for hidden patterns inside the data that is not directly apparent on the surface. In case the patterns match any of the early detected failures, it raises early failure signals indicating that a maintenance is imminent and the machine or equipment will go down if not acted upon. And the control center then starts a corrective action based upon the signal raised. Now, there is no need to think that corrective and predictive maintenance is only for machines. This is overview of condition-based maintenance applied to healthcare. This is very similar to mechanical maintenance except the asset being maintained is now a human being and the control action and the correct action lies in doctors. A typical architecture diagram of a condition-based maintenance management system looks as shown here. Sensors will be streaming data that passes through layers of analysis and finally correct action is suggested into a control center. We will now take a brief look into a sample application that demonstrates real-time monitoring and failure alerts. This is a sample application that demonstrates predicting failure rates for electric locomotive air brakes. What you are now seeing on your screen is a representation of control center interface. In the control center, a schematic representation of the asset being monitored is represented in a user-friendly interface with its state being updated from the sensor data collected. In this particular instance, the interface you are seeing is a representation of electric locomotive air brake. It collects data from sensors attached to electric locomotive and updates its states based upon the sensor data. 
Originally, this case study was done for Airbus A380 landing gear analysis. However, for the purpose of this demonstration, I have trimmed it down and will be instead studying the design principles based upon electric locomotive air brake and conducting the failure analysis for that one. In principle, the same concepts can be ap applied across different applications and verticals. For example, here is a chemical solvent recovery system. For those who are interested, these are HMS CADA controls from Genlogic. Now, to start with, this is a rough skeleton of electric locomotive air brake. A motor pump compresses air and supplies it to a main reservoir and auxiliary reservoir attached to different parts of the vehicle. In this case, the air also happens to go through air suspension, bezel, traction control, pneumatic doors and window piper and additional points. We are interested in driver's brake valve mechanism. There is an auxiliary reservoir that taps the air that is supplied from main reservoir and operates based upon a triple valve principle, supplying pressure to brake cylinder that in turn applies pressure to the brake. Typical locomotive electric air brake operates in five stages. The release stage, feed valve stage, lap stage, application stage and the emergency brake stage. Based upon the valve position, the triple valve automatically selects feed connectors connecting auxiliary reservoir and brake cylinder. For example, the last position is the emergency position in which auxiliary reservoir pumps air to the brake cylinder. Whereas in the release position, auxiliary reservoir charges its air and brake cylinder loses its pressure. On the top right corner you can see M life which stands for material life here and MTTF which stands for mean time to failure calculated in number of years. Of utmost importance to us is the alarm list and the failure rate that is presented here. Alarm list keeps track of the alarms raised by the monitoring center. In this particular case, whenever there is an emergency brake applied, it raises a warning and when the emergency brake is released, it goes back to normal stage. This is just indicative. Now, usually for this kind of setup, the data comes from sensors attached to the train. However, in this particular case, for this purpose of demonstration, I will be using a brake data simulator. As indicated earlier, data comes in two parts for the control center. One through the design specification and another through the operating conditions. Design specifications do not change once they are fixed. For example, once the brake is created, its design does not change till the end of its life. However, the operating conditions could vary. In this case, for a brake, the design details could be the type of the brake, such as drum brake, disc brake, etc. or the disc type, such as sintered metallic car resin etc and the wear coefficient disc thickness and disc area as indicated these do not change throughout its lifetime the operation conditions could be the temperature in which the brake is operating and the load weight sliding velocity the velocity with which it's rotating while the brake is being applied and the brake application rate which indicates the number of times the brake is being applied and the braking time for how long the brake is being applied each of these modifies the behavior of the brake in certain way decided through mathematical conditions and calculations. Each of them affect the material life of the brake which in turn affects the mean time to failure. As and when any of these conditions change, the control center keeps recalculating the mean time to failure based upon its internal calculations and updates the system data. And in case of any alarms, it raises the alarms. For example, here you can see MTTF, mean time to failure being notified as critical value because it is less than stipulated two year value. For the purpose of this demonstration, I have specified mean time to failure below 5 to be a warning level and below 2 to be a critical level. Since the mean time to failure is 1.57 years, which is below 2 years, it is raising a critical alarm. And in reality, in production, this critical alarm will also carry out additional operations such as notifying the administrators and if required, also notifying the maintenance schedule, the parts required and the correct labor schedule. The calculations on which these alarms are raised and the mean time to failure and material life are calculated are here. These are industry standard calculations which are derived from years of experience and observation. Now, let us change couple of operating conditions and see how the system varies. For example, let me increase the load weight and you can see the green line, the material life going down as the load weight increases. And let us increase the brake application rate. 
As you increase the break application rate, you can see the blue line, the failure rate increasing exponentially. And if you look at the failure rate, it has gone up to 456 from 50 earlier. So as I decrease the break application rate, it goes down, the failure rate goes down. The failure rate is calculated in terms of number of failures per 1 million hours. For those who are aware of Six Sigma quality, this is too far away from Six Sigma quality. Six Sigma quality dictates around 3.4 failures per 1 million. The material life is an indicator of how many number of break applications that are remaining before the material is completely worn out. It's a dimensionless unit. Even though the design conditions do not change in real time, for the purpose of this demonstration, let's consider changing them slightly and see how the MTTF varies. For example, as I change to annulus disk, the mean time to failure increases, which means annulus disk is a little bit more robust than drum kind of disk. So this is called as what if analysis. For example, when you are deciding between multiple components, this kind of analysis helps. Let's go into this what if analysis mode. Assume that I have the option to choose between drum break annulus disk, pad disk, etc. And I would like to know for the same operating conditions which would have given me more MTTF. The larger the number of MTTF, the more robust is my break. Let us change the temperature and see how it varies. So if you look at it, the carbon-carbon lining slotted annular disk combination gives three years of mean time to failure, whereas the asbestos lining with the drum break gives you only 1.3 years of mean time to failure. The failure rate is also indicated here for 1 million hours. For this, it is 90 failure per 1 million hours, whereas the carbon carbon, it's 38 failures for 1 million hours. So, this gives a complete picture of how you can side by side compare without actually doing real time tests. And this is also where the big data comes into picture. For example, here we are considering two dimensions. On one dimension we are taking break type, on the second dimension we are taking the disk type. And here there are, if in design there are multiple other parameters to vary, for example, wear coefficient, disk thickness, disk area. As you consider more and more design parameters, the number of dimensions increase and the time to calculate all the what if alternate scenarios is going to increase exponentially. Big Data addresses this problem by paralyzing all these conditions and pre-calculating them and giving you the picture in one go. So this covers the basics of real-time monitoring the sensor data and calculating the mean time to failure which indicates you the time required for the maintenance and the critical levels as and when it reaches and the material life in terms of the number of break applications etc. And in the next demonstration, we will be looking at how to predict the failure rate based upon previous historic data rather than real-time data. Assume that you have operators that do not have sensors attached to you. However, you may have previous historic failure data that tells at what times these machines might have failed. How do you calculate failure rates from the historic data without using sensors in real-time data? The sensor data helps you identify the failure pattern on the fly as the machine is operating. Whereas, when you cannot afford sensors, your historic data might be able to roughly estimate the same through similar procedures. Till next time, have a nice day.